On February 3rd, 1959, a plane containing rock and roll star Buddy Holly and three others took off from Mason City Municipal Airport in Iowa. Within five minutes, however, the plane crashed into a field outside the town of Clear Lake, killing everybody on board. The previous two years had seen Holly establish himself as a leading light of the emerging rock and roll movement, producing three albums, with two of them reaching the top five of the UK album charts. He also recorded top ten singles in the US such as That'll Be The Day, Peggy Sue and Oh Boy. Despite his early success, Holly found himself short of cash in late 1958. Having terminated his association with his band The Crickets, he found out that the band's manager, Norman Petty, had apparently stolen money from him. He also needed money to move to New York City to live with his new wife, Mary Elena, who was pregnant. Holly assembled a new band for his upcoming Winter Dance Party Tour, consisting of Waylon Jennings on bass, Tommy Alsop on guitar, and Cold Bunch on drums. The tour was set to appear in 24 American Midwest cities in as many days. New artist Richie Valens, JP the Big Bopper Richardson, and the vocal group Dion and the Belmonts joined the tour to promote their recordings. The entire company of musicians travelled together in one bus, although they had to use several as the buses frequently broke down and had to be replaced. It was estimated that they used five separate buses in the first 11 days of the tour alone. These buses were ill-equipped for the winter weather. One bus had a heating system that had malfunctioned shortly after the tour began. At one point, both Valens and Richardson experienced flu-like symptoms and Bunch was hospitalized for severely frostbitten feet due to a bus breaking down in the sub-zero weather conditions. On February 2nd, the touring party arrived in Clear Lake, Iowa, west of Mason City, for an unscheduled concert. Frustrated with the tour's travel situation, Holly chartered the plane to fly himself and his band to Fargo, North Dakota, after the show. Flight arrangements were made with a local pilot, Roger Peterson. Holly wanted his band to fly ahead, as he felt that they generated the most money. There are conflicting views on how both Valens and Richardson took his bandmate's seat on the plane. The most widely accepted version of events was... Richardson had contracted the flu and asked Jennings for his seat. Valens, who once had a fear of flying, asked Alsop for his seat. They tossed a coin, and Valens won. After the show, Holly, Richardson and Valens were driven to the airport. The weather at the time was reported as light snow, with winds from 20 to 30 miles per hour, 32 to 48 kilometers per hour. Although deteriorating weather conditions were expected along the route, this information was not relayed to the pilot. The plane took off at 12.55 a.m. Central Standard Time, or 1.55 Eastern Time. Hubert Dwyer, the plane's owner, was able to see the aircraft's taillight during its brief flight. After a couple of left turns, the aircraft climbed to approximately 800 feet 240 meters, above ground. After yet another left turn, he could see the light slowly descend until it disappeared. Subsequent attempts to reach the plane via radio went unanswered. Later that morning, Dwyer, having not heard from Peterson, took off in another airplane to retrace the route of the missing plane. At 9.35am, he spotted the wreckage less than 6 miles, 10 kilometers, northwest of the airport. There were no survivors. Mary Elena Holly learned of her husband's death from a television news report. A widow after only six months of marriage, she suffered a miscarriage shortly thereafter, reportedly due to psychological trauma. Holly's mother, upon hearing the news on the radio, screamed and collapsed. The official investigation was carried out by the Civil Aeronautics Board, the precursor to the NTSB. It emerged that Peterson and the Dwyer Flying Service were certified to operate only under visual flight rules. This meant the pilot must be able to see where he is going without relying solely on his instruments. However, on the night of the crash, this was virtually impossible due to the low clouds, lack of a visible horizon, and the absence of ground lights over the sparsely populated area. Furthermore, Peterson had received his instrument training on airplanes equipped with a conventional artificial horizon. While the plane involved in the accident 
used an older gyroscope. The two types of instruments, however, display the information in graphically opposite ways. On the artificial horizon, the sky is at the top and the ground at the bottom. In the aftermath of the crash and the miscarriage suffered by Holly's wife, protocols were changed whereby authorities were not to disclose names of victims until they had first notified their families. In June 1988, a four-foot granite memorial bearing the names of Peterson and the three entertainers was dedicated outside the surf ballroom in Clear Lake. Near the crash site, a monument depicting Buddy Holly's glasses was also erected. On the morning of January 28, 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded shortly after taking off from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It was the first fatal accident involving the Space Shuttle, killing all seven crew members aboard. First launched in 1981, the Shuttle was a partially reusable low-Earth orbital spacecraft. A total of five shuttles were built and flew a total of 135 missions until the program was retired in 2011. Missions included the launch of numerous satellites, interplanetary probes, and the Hubble Space Telescope. The shuttle crew would conduct science experiments in orbit, participated in the joint Shuttle Mir program with Russia, and participated in construction and servicing of the International Space Station. During the 1950s, the United States Air Force proposed using a reusable piloted glider to perform operations such as reconnaissance, satellite attack, and air-to-ground weapons deployment. In 1957, the Air Force conducted a study on the feasibility of reusable rocket boosters. This became the basis for the aerospace plane, a fully reusable spacecraft that was never developed beyond its initial design phase in the early 1960s. In December 1968, NASA created the Space Shuttle Task Group to determine the optimal design for a reusable spacecraft. By 1972, President Richard Nixon had approved the Space Shuttle. The Shuttle included the orbiter vehicle, a pair of recoverable solid rocket boosters, and the expendable external tank containing liquid hydrogen and oxygen. Each field join in the rocket boosters was sealed with two rubber O-rings around the circumference of the booster. The main purpose of these O-rings was to contain the hot, high-pressure gases produced by the boosters. On April 12, 1981, the Shuttle Columbia took off on the first ever shuttle mission, spending a total of two days in space after orbiting the Earth 36 times. By 1986, the shuttle program had undertaken 24 missions, nine by the Challenger. The crew was announced on January 27, 1985. A total of seven astronauts, including the first civilian, schoolteacher Krista McAuliffe, who flew as part of the Teacher in Space project. The air temperature on January 28 was predicted to be a record low for a space shuttle launch. The temperature was forecast to drop to 18 degrees Fahrenheit, or minus 8 degrees Celsius, overnight, before rising to 26 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 3 Celsius, at the scheduled launch time of just after 9.30 a.m. It was so cold that ice had formed on the launch tower overnight. The mission was delayed in order to allow this ice to melt, and at 11.38 a.m., two hours later than scheduled, Challenger was cleared to launch, with the air temperature at 36 degrees Fahrenheit, or 2 degrees Celsius. Shortly after takeoff, dark grey smoke could be seen escaping from the right side solid rocket booster. The cold temperature had prevented the O-rings and the rocket booster from creating a seal. Just 68 seconds into the flight, a plume could be seen coming from this location. A leak had begun in the liquid hydrogen tank of the external tank, causing the plume to increase in size. The flame then burned from the rocket booster into the fuel tank. 72 seconds into the flight, the right solid rocket booster detached partially from the external fuel tank. One second later, an explosion occurred in the liquid hydrogen tank, pushing it into the nearby liquid oxygen tank. The right solid rocket booster collided with the tank, causing a massive fireball that engulfed the space shuttle. The orbiter, now at an altitude of 46,000 feet, 14 kilometers, broke into several large pieces. 
the two solid rocket boosters separated and continued in uncontrolled flight until Mission Control initiated their self-destruct 110 seconds after the launch. The crew cabin containing the seven astronauts separated in one piece from the shuttle. Approximately 30 seconds after the explosion, it began a free fall towards the ocean. On July 28, 1986, NASA released a report on the deaths of the crew, and it found that the findings are inconclusive. The impact of the crew compartment with the ocean surface was so violent that evidence of damage occurring in the seconds which followed the disintegration was masked. Our final conclusions are the cause of death of the Challenger astronauts cannot be positively determined. The forces to which the crew were exposed during orbiter breakup were probably not sufficient to cause death or serious injury, and the crew possibly, but not certainly, lost consciousness in the seconds following the orbiter breakup due to in-flight loss of crew module pressure. The effectiveness of the solid rocket booster's O-rings came into question. A January 1985 flight was the coldest space shuttle launch to date, at a temperature of 62 degrees Fahrenheit, 17 degrees Celsius. Analysis of the flight identified erosion in the primary O-rings in both rocket boosters. Engineers determined that the cold temperature had caused a loss of flexibility in these O-rings and decreased their ability to seal the joints. In fact, erosion of the O-rings occurred in all but one shuttle mission throughout 1985. A presidential commission was formed on February 6, 1986 to investigate and find the cause of the disaster. It determined that the accident was due to hot gas blowing past the O-rings in the field joint of the right solid rocket booster and found no other potential cause for the disaster. It attributed the accident to the faulty design of the field joint that made it susceptible to damage in cold weather. The commission emphasized that both NASA and its contractor had overlooked evidence of the potential safety issues. Recommendations were made to improve the design to prevent the passage of hot gas past these O-rings. The space shuttle fleet was grounded for two years while the program underwent investigation, redesign and restructuring. Several memorials have been established in honor of the disaster. Pierce Park in Palo Alto, California features the Challenger Memorial Grove, including redwood trees grown from seeds carried aboard Challenger in 1985. On March 27, 1977, two Boeing 747 passenger jets collided on the runway at Los Rodeos Airport on the island of Tenerife, causing the most devastating plane crash in the history of aviation. The two planes, along with others that day, were scheduled to arrive at Las Palmas Airport on the nearby island of Gran Canaria. However, due to the explosion of a small bomb and the subsequent closure of this airport, all incoming planes were redirected to land at the smaller airport on Tenerife. Now known as Tenerife North, Los Rodeos was a regional airport that could not easily accommodate all of the traffic diverted from Gran Canaria. The airport only had one runway and only one major taxiway running parallel to it. There were also four mini taxiways connecting the two. The gathered airplanes took up so much space that they had to park on the long taxiway, making taxiing impossible. Instead, planes set for departure had to taxi up the main runway itself to get into position for takeoff. Once on the ground at Tenerife, the two flights involved in the accident, KLM Flight 4805 en route from Amsterdam and Pan Am Flight 1736 from Los Angeles readied for takeoff back to Gran Canaria. Manning the controls of the KLM flight were Captain Jakob Veldersen van Zanten, First Officer Klaus Mers, and Flight Engineer Willem Schroeder. At the time of the accident, van Zanten was KLM's chief flight instructor and had appeared in ads promoting the airline. The KLM jet was carrying 14 crew members and 235 passengers, including 52 children. After landing at Tenerife, the passengers disembarked at the terminal. One passenger who lived on the island with a boyfriend did not reboard the plane. The Pan Am crew consisted of Captain Victor Grubbs, First Officer Robert Bragg, and Flight Engineer George Warns, along with 13 flight attendants. 
on board were 380 passengers. The plane, named Clipper Victor, had a colourful existence. It operated the inaugural 747 commercial flight in January 1970, and seven months later became the first 747 to be hijacked, being forced to land in Havana, Cuba. Due to the relatively high altitude at Los Rodeos, the airport is 633 meters, or 2,077 feet above sea level, drifting clouds of different densities would cause unpredictable visibility. One moment visibility was good, the next you could barely see in front of you. The authorities reopened Gran Canaria Airport once the bomb threat had been neutralized. The Pan Am flight was ready to prepare for takeoff, but its path was blocked on the taxiway by the KLM flight, which had decided to refuel instead. Refueling took about 35 minutes, after which time the passengers reboarded. The search for a missing Dutch family of four that had not yet returned to the plane merely prolonged the delay. Once refueled, the tower instructed the KLM flight to taxi up the entire length of the runway, then make a 180 degree turn to prepare for takeoff. Shortly thereafter, the Pan Am flight was instructed to taxi behind the KLM flight and exit the runway on the third taxiway, or exit C3, then use the main taxiway to get into takeoff position. However, the crew was not sure whether the controller had instructed them to exit at the first or the third taxiway exit. The crew asked for clarification and were informed, the third one, sir, one, two, three, third, third one. The crew had trouble locating the third taxiway exit, seeing no sign for C3 in the poor visibility. They were so unsure of their location that they were closer to the fourth taxiway exit when the collision occurred. In fact, taking the C3 exit would require a turn of 148 degrees, leading them back towards a terminal. In order to return to the main taxiway, this would require another 148 degree turn. A study performed after the accident by the Airline Pilots Association deemed this second turn would be a practical impossibility. Once the Pan Am plane entered the runway, it experienced rapidly decreasing visibility. As they taxied towards the runway, visibility was at 500 meters, 1600 feet. Shortly after they turned onto the runway, it decreased to 100 meters, or 330 feet. The KLM plane made its 180 degree turn to prepare for takeoff in relatively good visibility. However, clouds were approaching at speed of about 14 miles an hour, or 22 kilometers an hour. After lining up for takeoff, the KLM captain advanced the throttle and the plane started to move forward. First Officer Mers advised him that they had not yet received takeoff clearance from the air traffic control tower. Captain Van Zanten replied, No, I know that. Go ahead, ask. Mers then radioed the tower that they were ready for takeoff and waiting for our ATC clearance. The tower provided instructions on the route to be taken after takeoff, but did not explicitly state that they were cleared for takeoff. First Officer Mers read the instructions back to the tower and stated that we are now at takeoff. Captain Van Zanten interrupted his first officer with the comment, We're going. The controller, who could not see the runway due to the fog, initially responded with the comment, OK, a non-standard terminology. This reinforced the captain's belief that they had takeoff clearance. The controller then immediately added, Stand by for takeoff. I will call you. A simultaneous radio call from the Pan Am flight caused radio interference, which was audible in the KLM cockpit as a long shrill sound, or a heterodyne. This caused them to miss the crucial last part of the tower's response that they will call the KLM flight back. The Pan Am crew's transmission was, We're still taxiing down the runway, the Clipper 1736. This message was also blocked by the interference, and inaudible to the KLM crew. Due to the fog, neither plane was able to see the other on the runway. In addition, 
Neither plane could be seen by the air traffic control tower, and the airport was not equipped with ground radar. Meanwhile, the Pan Am flight had not yet located its taxiway exit, and continued on its confused journey down the runway. According to the cockpit voice recorder, the Pan Am captain said, There he is! when he spotted the KLM plane's landing lights through the fog, just as his plane approached exit C4. When it became clear that the KLM flight was approaching at full speed, the Pan Am first officer yelled, Get off! Get off! Get off! Captain Grubbs applied full throttle and made a sharp left turn towards the grass in a last-ditch attempt to avoid a collision. By the time the KLM pilots saw the Pan Am plane, they were already travelling too fast to stop. They attempted a premature takeoff to avoid a collision, causing a 22 meter or 72 foot tail strike. When it left the ground, the KLM plane was within 100 meters or 330 feet of the Pan Am plane, and travelling at approximately 260 kilometers an hour or 160 miles per hour. While the landing gear on the nose of the KLM plane missed the Pan Am, its left side engines, lower fuselage, and main landing gear struck the upper right side of the Pan Am plane. The KLM's right side engines crashed through the Pan Am jet directly behind the cockpit. Both airplanes were destroyed in the collision. All 248 passengers and crew aboard the KLM plane perished as did 335 passengers and crew aboard the Pan Am plane. Due to the thick fog and smoke, firefighters initially did not know two planes were involved, as they were concentrating on the wreck of the KLM flight. The investigation concluded that the main cause of disaster was the KLM captain's insistence on taking off without receiving takeoff clearance, compounded by the deteriorating weather and a desire to comply with KLM's new regulations on maximum flight time per day. Other factors it concluded were the thick fog as neither the control tower nor the two planes could see each other and interference from the simultaneous radio transmissions. Use of non-standard terminology such as OK and we're at takeoff were also blamed for the accident. As a consequence of the disaster Aviation authorities around the world introduced standard terminologies for communication between air traffic control and flight crews, and a greater emphasis on English as a common language. Following the accident, the Spanish government installed ground radar at Los Rodeos Airport. Two memorials to the victims of the disaster were built, one on Tenerife and another in Amsterdam. On July 25, 2000, Air France Concorde Flight 4590 crashed shortly after taking off from Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. The accident claimed the lives of all 109 passengers and crew on board, along with an additional four people on the ground. The crash was the only fatal Concorde accident during the plane's 27-year history. The Concorde, purchased by Air France in 1976, was powered by four Rolls-Royce turbojet engines, each equipped with afterburners. The aircraft's last scheduled repair had occurred just four days before the crash. No problems had been reported during the repair. The flight, en route to John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York, was chartered by the German company Peter Delman Cruises. Passengers were on their way to board the cruise ship MS Deutschland for a 16-day cruise to Ecuador. Five minutes before the Concorde's scheduled takeoff, Continental Airlines Flight 55, a McDonnell Douglas DC-10, took off from the same runway. During takeoff, a small titanium alloy strip that was a part of the engine cover fell off and landed on the tarmac. During its takeoff run, the Concorde ran over this debris, cutting its right front tire, sending a large chunk of tire debris into the underside of its left wing at an estimated speed of 140 meters per second, or 310 miles per hour. Although the impact did not puncture any of the fuel tanks in the wing, it sent a shockwave that ruptured fuel tank number 5 at its weakest point, just above the undercarriage. The ruptured tank released large quantities of fuel, 
while tyre fragments severed wiring in the landing gear bay, preventing the retraction of the landing gear. Fuel from the ruptured tank ignited, causing a loss of power in both engines 1 and 2. Engine 1 slowly recovered over the next few seconds. A large plume of fire developed, and the flight engineer shut down engine 2 in response to the fire warning. This lack of thrust, increased drag from the damaged landing gear, and fire damage to the flight controls made the plane impossible to control. Just two minutes after takeoff, the plane crashed into a hotel in nearby Gonesse, killing four people on the ground and injuring a further six. Air traffic control on the ground noticed the flames and informed the flight crew before the plane was airborne. However, the plane had exceeded V1 speed. V1 speed is a speed at which it is deemed too unsafe to abort the takeoff. As a result of the damage, the Concorde was unable to gain enough airspeed and unable to climb or accelerate, and its speed decreased during its brief flight. With engine 2 shut down, engine 1 surged in power again, causing the right wing to lift. This caused the plane to bank at an angle of over 100 degrees. The crew reduced power in engines 3 and 4 in an attempt to level the aircraft but the plane continued its deceleration until it finally stalled. Air France Flight 4590 crashed into the Hotel Lissimo Le Relais Bleu Hotel. A video of the burning plane on takeoff and the aftermath of the crash was captured on video by a passing motorist. The crew tried to divert to nearby Paris Le Bourget Airport. However, accident investigators determined that a safe landing would have been unlikely due to the plane's flight path. The Concorde's cockpit voice recorder recorded the last intelligible words in the cockpit. Until the crash, Concorde had been considered one of the safest airplanes in the world. The crash was a direct cause of the end of Concorde's illustrious career. Within days of the crash, all Air France Concordes were grounded as a result of the accident, pending an investigation into the cause of the crash. Although British Airways claimed to make a profit on its fleet of Concordes, Air France's operation had been a money-losing venture and it was claimed that the airplane was kept in operation only as a source of national pride. The accident investigation concluded that the Concorde was over the maximum takeoff weight by 810 kilograms, or 1,790 pounds. The wear strip that fell off the Continental DC-10 had been replaced twice in the months leading up to the accident. It had neither been manufactured nor installed according to the procedures set out by the manufacturer. A monument in honour of the crash victims was erected at Gonesse. The Concorde fleet was retired by both British Airways and Air France in 2003. On the afternoon of May 25, 1979, American Airlines Flight 191 crashed shortly after takeoff from Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. All 258 passengers and 13 crew on board, along with two people on the ground, were killed in the accident. With a total of 273 fatalities, the crash is the deadliest aviation accident in US history. The aircraft, a McDonnell Douglas DC-10, was on a scheduled flight to Los Angeles International Airport when the accident occurred. As the aircraft approached takeoff speed, Engine number one detached from the left wing of the plane, taking a 3 foot or 0 0.9 meter section of the wing's leading edge along with it. Robert Graham, supervisor of maintenance for American Airlines stated, As the aircraft got closer, I noticed what appeared to be vapor or smoke of some type coming from the leading edge of the wing 
and the number one engine pylon. I noticed that the number one engine was bouncing up and down quite a bit. Once the aircraft started rotation, the engine came off, went up over the top of the wing, and rolled back down onto the runway. The aircraft continued a fairly normal climb until it started to turn to the left, and at that point, I thought he was going to come back to the airport. What was said in the cockpit in the final 50 seconds of the flight was not known, as the cockpit voice recorder lost power when the engine detached. In addition to the failure of the engine, several related systems failed. The detached engine's hydraulic system was damaged, but still operational. The electrical systems powered by engine one also failed, causing many systems to go offline including the captain's instrument panel and stick shaker. The aircraft climbed to about 325 feet or 100 meters above the ground while releasing a trail of fuel and hydraulic fluid from the left wing. The failure of the left engine's hydraulic system meant that the wing slats were locked in place. As a result, the left wing stalled, causing the aircraft to bank to the left at an angle of 112 degrees. The aircraft impacted the ground in a field around 4,600 feet or 1,400 meters from the end of the runway. Large sections of debris were hurled into a nearby trailer park, destroying five trailers and several cars. The plane had also crashed into a nearby aircraft hangar. It was completely destroyed by the impact and the ignition of 21,000 gallons 79,500 litres of fuel. No sizable components other than the engine and tail section remained. In addition to the 271 people on board Flight 191, two employees at a nearby repair garage were also killed, and two more were severely burned. Witnesses to the crash confirmed that the plane had not struck any debris on the runway. Investigators concluded that the accident must have been caused by some form of structural failure. The National Transportation Safety Board determined that the left engine's pylon had been damaged during an earlier engine change at the airline's maintenance facility, only months before the disaster. Standard engine removal procedure recommended by McDonnell Douglas called for the engine to be detached from the pylon first before finally removing the pylon from the wing. However, American Airlines, along with other airlines, had developed a time-saving procedure that would remove both the engine and pylon as a single unit. This removal method involved using a large forklift. Positioning of the forklift had to be extremely accurate. If it was out of position, structural damage to the wing could occur. This element of risk was compounded by a shift change that occurred during the removal. The normal loss of hydraulic pressure due to the shutdown of the forklift's engine caused a misalignment between the engine unit and the wing. This misalignment, while not enough to cause immediate structural failure, caused fatigue cracking that developed further over each takeoff and landing over the two months leading up to the crash, until the attachment finally failed. The NTSB determined that the loss of engine and the damage to the wing's leading edge should not have been enough to cause the crash. The report stated that the pilots should have been able to return the plane to the airport using its remaining two engines. However, the DC-10, unlike other planes, relied on hydraulic fluid to maintain the airflow over the wing. As the engine severed the hydraulic fluid lines, the resulting loss of pressure led to the wing stall. The procedure of removing both the engine and pylon as a single unit was banned. Despite the drop in reputation, the DC-10 continued to have a long career as a passenger and cargo aircraft. A memorial to the victims of the crash was finally dedicated in 2011.